Welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. Dr. Carrie is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please welcome your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Functional Medicine Radio Show, the only Internet radio show dedicated to giving you real solutions to improve your health. Not only are they real solutions, but they're natural solutions as well, because as you know, the one and only true wealth you have is your health. I'm your host, Dr. Kerry Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc, and I'm committed to helping you find the root cause of your health problem, fix the cause with natural treatments so you can feel normal again and live your life to the fullest. Just a quick bit of housekeeping before I introduce today's special guest. I'm happy to announce that I'm working on my next book. The title is Reclaim Your Digestive Health and Feel Normal Again, Fixing the Root Cause of Your GI Distress with Natural Treatments. Now this book should be ready later this year, so keep an eye out for it. All right, that's it for our housekeeping, so let's get started. I'm so excited about this week's show because my special guest is Dr. Joel Kahn. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Now, Dr. Kahn is a professor of medicine and known as America's Healthy Heart Doc. He has been treating patients for over 25 years and combines high-tech and high-touch natural therapies to reach his goal of preventing one million heart attacks, starting with yours. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan School of Medicine and has advanced cardiology training. He has authored over 150 scientific papers, three books that all reach number one on Amazon, and hundreds of blogs found on the Huffington Post and Mind Body Green. Dr. Khan, thank you so much for being my special guest today on this episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. I'm fired up, and it's my total pleasure. Thank you. Gosh, you're a really busy guy with all that you do, Dr. Khan. Well, you know, you're doing it too, and uh, <laughs> it's fun. I mean, truly, I'm glad uh, to always talk and teach because, you know, when you get a passion, you get a purpose, life uh, just rolls along in a good way. I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, Latin, doctor in Latin means teacher. Yes. Okay, so I'm excited about today's topic because we're going to talk about how to never die of heart disease. That's a pretty bold statement that we're making right now. Uh, it's bold, but should be on every billboard and every sign as our standard because it is doable uh, you know, to a very high degree. Nearly every heart attack could have been anticipated with an, an evaluation that is now standard routine, and I do almost every day in my clinic on patients. Now, cardiovascular disease, I would say, is pretty common, wouldn't you? Say yeah. that, Dr. Khan. <laughs> Still remains number one cause. When you say cardiovascular, which is heart attack and stroke and associated less common problems like aneurysms, number one cause of death in the Western world, men and women, equally lethal to uh, independent of gender or race. In fact, maybe a little bit higher in African American populations. And we know a lot. Um, and we wait till people are in the emergency room to apply advanced care, which I'm part of. I'm trained in stents and heart attack treatment, but, you know, we just lost Gary Shandling, and I do not know the details. I'm not his cardiologist, famous comedian, the Gary Shandling show, but, you know, two years, five years, ten years before his death from uh, what appeared to be an acute myocardial infarction, he had undoubtedly a way to detect the pathophysiology and the extent of his coronary disease, and then a way to apply strategies, lifestyle, and others to reverse it. Okay, so I wanted to ask you what uh, started your interest into functional medicine and cardiology? Yeah, that's a good question. I got interested in nutrition early on and uh, walked into undergrad, University of Michigan, 1977, so nearly 40 years ago, and looked around and said, I'm a vegetarian. It was simple. It was the only thing that looked like I would possibly eat. Uh, and that actually is a true uh, and long-term commitment in that regard, having moved on, influenced heavily by Dr. Dean Ornish and others, 
to apply uh, nutrition in cardiology and particularly now plant-based nutrition. And then I know I needed to know, know more. I was interested in supplements. I was reading, if anybody's familiar, Life Extension magazine once a month. Uh, had some colleagues in town that were functional medicine, primary care docs, and said, you know, uh, there's got to be more to understanding. I mean, I and, and I had a great practice, but I mean, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, statin, aspirin, next patient. Beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, statin, aspirin, next patient. And there's great things that could be done with those, but there had to be more. And uh, found out, you know, mind body and fitness in more detail and infrared sauna and on and on. It just had to find the right course, the right kind of uh, people, and uh, have not stopped since then because it's just fascinating. It's made my practice so much more interesting. And I can imagine your practice is radically different than those of your peers. And even now, you know, compared to four or five years ago, I bet it's radically different. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I made a pretty radical shift. I, for 26 years, I've been in pretty standard group practices, trying in a 15-minute appointment to get in nutrition, some advanced testing, uh, some instructional material on mind-body stress management. And it's possible. You can do a lot of good in 15 minutes, even addressing sleep and uh, stress management, but I knew I wanted to do more. So in October of 2015, I broke away from my group practice and have been out on my own, and I stopped taking insurance because I spend at least an hour with every patient now. I have a Nutribullet on my desk with all my uh, spinach and blueberries and flaxseed to show them a new path to breakfast that isn't bacon, eggs, and uh, hash browns. Um, do very advanced testing and really focus on early identification, early reversal. I love it. I'm attracting patients who are looking for either that special attention or the focus on heart disease reversal. So let's talk about early identification because a lot of listeners out there, they go see their doctor. The doctor probably runs a standard um, cholesterol panel, at least in Canada. This is what I see. They run the cholesterol panel and uh, a CBC, a B12, sometimes a ferritin, that's like what's done. So I know a lot of patients, they, they know like there's got to be more. How do I really know what's going on? What are some of the more advanced tests that can be done to better detect earlier different cardiovascular problems? Sure, and I'm not being comical in this answer, but medicine always starts with history. So I've got a really detailed dietary history. I know their sleep pattern. I know their social situation. I know if they love their work or hate their work or love their spouse or hate their spouse. I mean, because these are, you know, we're talking about functional medicine, root cause. Why aren't they going to the gym? Well, because they're sleeping five hours a night and they're exhausted. And why are they sleeping five hours a night? We've got to talk about sleep hygiene or hormonal status. You know, we've got to connect all the dots. So history, physical is kind of the same as I've always done. Maybe I look for earlobe creases and some other things a little bit more. But blood work-wise, even maybe in a system that doesn't lend itself to the Wild West like we can do in the United States, I, I use currently a panel called Cleveland Heart, kind of a subsidiary of the Cleveland Clinic, very extensive inflammatory oxidative um, genetic markers, some of these new markers like TMAO and ADMA that are – related to cardiovascular disease and function. But if you had to pick like a smaller list, everybody should have a lipoprotein A. I mean, there's, you know, it's genetically determined. It's heavily linked. It may be, it may be according to Dr. Linus Pauline and uh, another physician named Matthias Rath, more important than LDL cholesterol and development of plaque. Um, but at least it's important in Europe. It's part of the standard European Society atherosclerosis evaluation. Everybody gets cholesterol and lipoprotein A. It's not expensive. Uh, I like to check homocysteine. I mean, I like to check a thyroid lab because if the cholesterol is high, it might be underlying subclinical hypothyroidism and such. Um, you know, you can go deeper, but at least then you've added uh, quite a bit of additional information. So you breezed over something that really fast, the earlobe crease. And I yes. know what that is, but I bet a lot of listeners don't. Yeah, so there are some um, you know, unusual markers that could indicate. There, of course, is classic angina nobody should ever miss. I Walking up a hill, I get tight, and I have to sit on the park bench, I feel better. 
but that could be just shortness of breath and not tightness, so that would be shortness of breath as an angelo equivalent. It could be my calves cramp up and I've got to sit on the park bench, so that would be claudication as a ischemic equivalent. And then occasionally it could be back pain, palpitations, nausea, fatigue, uh, a little tougher to parse out fatigue because so many reasons for fatigue. But then there's a few others, uh, central uh, baldness on top prematurely may indicate some risk factors, erectile dysfunction in a man, may indicate diffuse atherosclerosis, should prompt a pretty thorough evaluation of blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, lifestyle. And then the last one is a silly earlobe crease. Uh, something I learned about probably 30 to 40 years ago is just a physical exam finding. It's a deep groove in the lower part of the earlobe uh, that isn't due to wearing a five pound earring. Um, and uh, it, it was kind of forgotten, but about two years ago, a few studies came out using more advanced technology like CT and geography, correlating it with the presence or absence of earlobe crease, and it's pretty good. I'm like an earlobe evaluator. If I see people in the airport, I'm really struggling. Somebody needs to tell that man or woman they've got a deep groove and they need some sort of cardiovascular test. Uh, mine would be a calcium score. We can talk about that. But um, so it's a it's a fun little thing. I've written about it in a few you know lay blogs or just. Google and take a look at some of the pictures of a diagonal earlobe crease in heart disease. Yeah, it's a simple little thing. And so for the listeners out there, you know, you can pause right now and go look in the mirror. And then, yeah, when you're at the grocery store, you're at the mall, you can look at other people's earlobes and, and you will spot this crease in the earlobe. And that, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Khan has said, can be indicative, uh, indicative of, you know, future cardiovascular problems. Okay, so... Um, so you mentioned, of course, cholesterol panel, lipoprotein A, homocysteine, thyroid. Okay, so we get these things done, and let's say, you know, they come back as abnormal. Then what is usually the next step that you take? Well, I'm, I may take either path. I may um, first do kind of a history physical and a semi or complete advanced lab evaluation. But if somebody's got a, a risk factor or a family relative or they're interested in their status um, or they have a job at risk, um, I like to go to directly do some sort of vascular imaging. You know, what does a cholesterol 230 mean? Even if you know the LDL particle and the particle size, what does that mean unless you know if the arteries are youthful and unencumbered by plaque or silently developing plaque. Clearly, you're going to take a different approach, a more aggressive approach in one circumstance than the other. So, you know, for a good 15 to 20 years, we've had two imaging studies. Well, we can go beyond two. You, you, could, you could have a reason to do a ultrasound of the abdomen. I go through the chart. Let me just say this. Sometimes there's free information. Is there a chest x-ray that suggests um, aortic or vascular calcification or an abdominal x-ray or leg x-ray that mentions arterial calcification is there a CT that's been done for any reason in the past that mentions either clear cut uh, low hanging fruit if it mentions coronary calcifications and they often do uh, mention it um, I wish it was standard that radiologists reading a chest CT with incidental coronary calcification but it could you know be uh, mentioned in the aorta um, either thoracic or abdominal. So I'd look for those. And, you know, now there's some interest in finding mammary calcification in arteries on a mammogram being now a pretty well-established identifier of premature coronary artery disease. So you look for these secret little freebies that are already out there, um, like a diagonal earlobe crease of a chest X-ray, and then you can go to specific testing. So about 15 to 20 years ago, CAT scans got fast enough to allow the motion of the heart to no longer interfere with seeing the heart and we could now resolve the three coronary arteries without injecting dye and that's called the coronary artery calcium scan by CT. It's become a test of not a thousand dollars but at least in my neighborhood it's a hundred dollars. A test that used to be a decent amount of radiation but because of the speed of CT scans it's usually under what's judged to be one millisievert or about the same as a mammogram and um, there's just a boatload of scientific studies and uh, guideline support to say a person of medium age with one risk factor, this is a way to identify silent heart disease at the earliest stage. You may, you know, it's like being one week pregnant if you come back with a calcium score of eight or twelve or sixteen rather than the perfect zero. 
Uh, but sometimes it comes back a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, and there's just years of progressive arterial calcification that's been silent and unknown. There's an amazing documentary called The Widowmaker that I'd encourage all listeners of your podcast to uh, go get on Netflix. It documents this whole story of the coronary calcium CT from the early days to present, why in the state of Texas in the United States it's a covered benefit by insurances because of one legislature's kind of passion to uh, provide preventive testing to the residents of Texas and why it's basically cash-based in all the other states and why that shouldn't be. So that's one approach. $100, I call it truth serum, um, low radiate. Have a big green leafy salad with red peppers, yellow peppers. Before you go to your CAT scan, you'll have your blood streaming with antioxidants, maybe even better way to get a CAT scan. Uh, the other one, there's an ultrasound of the carotids. You can just do a routine ultrasound. Um, and that may reveal some silent plaque. Um, you know, you usually, at least in the States, need an indication and a reason to order one, um, although some hospitals offer it as part of just a screening program at a very low cost. But there's one specifically called the CIMT, C for carotid, IM for intimal medial, and T for thickness, CIMT, which um, uses software to measure the thickness of the two inner layers of an artery where atherosclerosis begins, you're 50 years old, you get the measurement, it's compared to other 50-year-olds of your gender, Are, is your arterial age 50 or 40 or 60, uh, which may prompt, again, a less or more aggressive uh, pursuit of lifestyle and risk factors. I mean, everybody should pursue a heart-healthy lifestyle, but, um, you know, I don't treat people with statins that don't have disease. If they don't have calcification, if they don't have increased IMT, that be, to me is like using chemotherapy in somebody that doesn't have cancer. I mean, if they don't have the disease, I'm working on lifestyle on that, giving a prescription drug. So, Dr. Khan, you're giving us a lot of great information. And I know for us up here in Canada, I practice in Ontario, and I've got to say, apart from the thyroid test and the cholesterol test, I've never seen any of these other tests come across my desk. Yeah, there is, um, I don't know if you're in Toronto, there is a kind of uh, employee benefit preventive center in Toronto. I think it's called MedCan, M-E-D-C-A-N. I have some relatives that are hotshot lawyers in Toronto, and it's a benefit their firm gives them to get an executive physical, and I'm quite sure they have calcium scoring there. Great. Um, there may be more. You know, it's basically it's any advanced CT scanner uh, with you do need a software package to measure that number, so um, it's not just a guess. Uh, but, uh, you know, one would want to ask in Calgary or Vancouver or Halifax, uh, the local hospital, do they offer coronary artery calcium scoring? Perfect. So that really helps our listeners out there right now who are thinking, okay, where, where can I go and have some of these tests done? I'm actually in Ottawa, which is not that far from Toronto. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I know that's an outpatient facility, and maybe somebody could just, you know, write a check for a couple hundred dollars or whatever they might choose to share, uh, uh, charge, excuse me. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't get it every year. It's a one-time thing. Uh, some people talk about repeating it in five to six years. This is a very good reason. But it is not that much radiation. We're all concerned about radiation. Uh, it's like a mammogram. So there have been a lot of interesting advances in cardiology. Can you mention any others that have happened in the last few years? Um, we've learned that diet matters. No, that's not a revolution. I mean, it's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's critical. I mean, we have learned a lot, of course. And, uh, you know, the dietary pattern of, as was fleshed out, and that's a funny word to use by Dr. Ornish, Dr. Esselstyn, um, that science has stood up well. Nobody has a question that there's been some secret uh, patients that weren't included in, you know, kind of these pioneers in heart disease reversal using plant-based diets without added oil. They remain very solid approaches. Um, uh, you know, I would say there's increasing evidence that supplements may be a benefit. That's when you get in an academic center, and I'm, I have a professorship at two universities in the Detroit area, you can really start a war, go to Grand Rounds, and yell at I love vitamins, and, you know, you'll see food fight. 
But CoQ10, I mean, it's true. <laughs> CoQ10, which, you know, most functional medicine doctors would consider kind of like air or oxygen. Yes. Um, but nonetheless, in 2013, a nice trial of congestive heart failure using 300 milligrams a day of CoQ10, coenzyme Q10, or placebo, showed really dramatic clinical improvement, rise in ejection fraction. And even in the last month or so, it was a nice randomized trial of vitamin D. People with congestive heart failure, low ejection fraction, who got vitamin D or placebo, establishing that vitamin D supplementation raises ejection fraction and to some extent improves some cardiac uh, parameters beyond that. Um, you know, there's a lot that haven't been studied, and we need studies of taurine and ribose and uh, magnesium and some of these syndromes. We use them, but we don't, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't convince the world about it. Um, and then um, what else is hot? You know, statin intolerance was announced in the last few weeks as a real syndrome by cardiologists. You know, it only took, you know, we've had the drugs for 20 years, and um, the American College of Cardiology released some data that, lo and behold, if you have people that are complaining of achiness and weakness and you stop their statin and then you resume it, they get the same symptoms back. And it was like a revelation uh, just in the last few weeks uh, verifying what pretty much any doctor who's ever talked to a patient knows. Some do well on statins and seem to be okay, but some really feel garbagey and it's not in their head and it's uh, not saying they're making up. So there is a new class of cholesterol-lowering drugs that are very expensive, but they're very effective, and we need them because not everybody responds to diet, to lifestyle, and some can't take statins, and some don't want to take statins. So they're called PCSK9 inhibitors. They're an injectable new drug that causes your LDL receptor to stay on the membrane of your liver cells so that it can um, pluck LDL and other cholesterol subparticles out of the blood uh, bring them into the liver for metabolism and the blood cluster level drops like a stone now associated with decreased chance of heart attack stroke and need for bypass and angioplasty so I have a handful of people giving themselves an injection twice a month their cholesterol drops 50 to 60 percent of course we only have two three four years of clinical follow-up we thought statins were perfect in the first two three four years so one has to keep you know uh, concern for the long run that we don't see problems, but those are very exciting additions to what we're doing. Um, the, the role of mind-body meditation has um, real scientific support. It's not used enough. Uh, infrared sauna has wonderful real scientific support in cardiovascular disease. It's not used enough. Um, I think those would be kind of the things I've been most excited about, and maybe the role of sleep. You know, full-blown Pickwickian syndrome and maybe, you know, full-blown, obvious sleep apnea. But just in general, the role of uh, a study in the last two years, if you do everything right, you don't smoke, you walk every day for fitness, you keep your waist thin, you eat your fruits and vegetables, you actually have a little red wine, which is usually associated with a better outcome, great reduction in heart attack risk. But if you throw in, I sleep seven to eight hours at night rather than five to six, you add a tremendous amount of additional um, reduction in your risk of heart attack. So another good piece of news uh, in terms of kind of the functional whole body approach to cardiovascular prevention. Dr. Khan, can you talk a little bit about the research on infrared sauna and heart health? Because yeah, that's, that's really interesting stuff. Yes, and if I had a long enough cable to my microphone, I'd go in my bedroom, turn it on, do the interview from mine. <laughs> It's called a full-spectrum infrared sauna. I used it this morning after a workout in my basement. But um, it is uh, mainly Japanese data that they started about 25 years ago. One particular medical institution did some animal studies showing that heat um, improved endothelial function. Heat seemed to increase nitric oxide, uh, improve vasodilator status, um, and then they applied it to humans with congestive heart failure, and they were identifying it. And these are all published peer-reviewed studies, improvements in walking time, decrease in breathing symptoms, decrease in lab tests like your BNP, uh, measurement of congestive heart failure. Um, then they actually did a randomized trial. It's called a WAON, W-A-O-N therapy in Japan, soothing warmth three times a week or so at 160 degrees for 15 minutes. These people sit in an infrared sauna wrapped in towels. 
they come out after 15 minutes, they lie down to cool off and drink water to replete themselves. And they do it on a repeated basis, and it's pretty remarkable. So that was bolstered by a um, early 2015, a study out of Sweden using a different kind of sauna, a Swedish wet sauna, but that in general, the number of times you visit a sauna a week and the number of minutes per session correlates with your overall survival in Sweden. Um, you know, independent of everything else that was measured like blood pressure and cholesterol. So um, I'm a big fan. You know, whether it's the detoxifying um, aspects and we're taking out phthalates or uh, heavy metals, whether it's endothelial improvement for other reasons, um, you know, it's a pretty exciting therapy and certainly one of the ones patients really enjoy. So I wanted to switch gears and talk to you or ask you about cholesterol and eggs because I still get this question in my practice what about eating eggs isn't it gonna affect my cholesterol so that question is still out there that listeners still have well I give you uh, you know my take of the science it's not biased because I choose to eat a vegan diet it, you know I make recommendations to patients as much as I can dissociating my lifestyle from what you know they ought to do um, and you know I so if you go back in the literature when people were thin and when average cholesterols were under 150, which isn't that long ago, there's this fascinating study. I wrote about it this week in a blog on Mind Body Green. Uh, they came out of a university in India, 30 men, their average cholesterol, they were thin because that was a natural body weight. Their average cholesterol was 125, and they fed them a high butter fat diet. Well, what happens if you take thin people with an average cholesterol of 125 and feed them butter fat, give them bulletproof coffee? The cholesterol sh shoots up over 200 very quickly. And that's what most of the old studies show about eggs, that um, if you go back before we were obese and before we had diabetes with the frequency and before we had average cholesterols of 220, 230 in America, because there was a time that they averaged less, is studies that show adding eggs in metabolic studies and such. There was a rapid rise in cholesterol and um, some other data like uh, endothelial dysfunction and a rise in endotoxin in the blood with higher fat meals. You know, most recent studies in the past five to ten years have struggled to reproduce or find the same findings and I've been impressed by the argument if you're smoking 20 cigarettes a day and you add two more you're going to be pretty hard put to define that two cigarettes a day are harmful because they're on a baseline that's already so bloated with nicotine and tar and other toxins. If you eat a standard American diet and then you do a study that looks at two eggs a day versus none, there may not be as much of a difference because uh, you've already at that plateau that's the equivalent of a pack a day. So there is also, somebody has an interesting slide that about 15 years ago most egg-based studies started to be funded by the Egg Institute and the number of studies that showed eggs raised cholesterol and might be cardiovascular risk was very high prior to that and very low after that <laughs> whether that's true or not. So I advise my cardiac patients and diabetic patients to follow the recommendations of the American Heart and American Diabetes Association which still talk about eliminating or eliminating eggs from their diet. If I'm trying to reverse coronary artery disease, I'm going to go with Dr. Dean Ornish, and I'm going to go with Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, and I'm going to go with Dr. Or Mr. Nathan Pritikin, that these are foods you avoid if you're trying to reverse the number one most serious disease in the Western society until somebody does a heart disease reversal study of eggs or no eggs and shows that it doesn't matter because that's never been done, so you, you can't answer affirmatively that it's good for a cardiac patient. Okay, so Dr. Khan, uh, last question here. If you were stranded on a desert island, what are three things that you want, would want to have or do or take to help your heart? To help my heart? Uh, I'd take some spices. I'd take some turmeric, cinnamon, nutmeg, and rosemary. Um, I'd take some gym shoes and a pedometer so I can move my body and keep at it in some sort of scientific way. And I'd take a Nutribullet so I could grind up those leaves and those berries and make myself a morning smoothie. How's that? Perfect. And what what do you put in your Nutribullet? Well, it's funny. I posted <laughs> it. I really, I, I took a bad hair morning this morning. I worked out. I went in my sauna. And then I told my wife, <laughs> fill me and see if I can make a great smoothie in under 60 seconds. I'll post on my uh, Facebook page, which I managed to go about a minute and 20 seconds. So anybody could go to my, well, you'll probably ask me how to find me. But, um, you know, um, 
organic blueberries, organic green, something green, spinach, kale, arugula, whatever's in the refrigerator, a lot of flaxseed, a lot of hemp, a lot of spices. I'll put turmeric, curry powder. I'll put the cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice, clove kind of stuff. Um, if I have powders around, I might. I put a little maca in this morning. I don't do that every day. I had a nice strawberry flavored pea protein, inchasachi protein. I'm not big on anti-X or protein. I'm not neurotic um, about it at all. Uh, I have a T-shirt I wear when I work out that says "Keep calm. Plants have protein." So I really don't. Uh, <laughs> I don't worry too much about it. But if it's around and it's tasty, I'll throw it in. And then just some rice milk, almond milk. I I don't like carrageenan in my food or carrageenan, if you want to say it that way. So I pretty much sure my almond milk doesn't have that potentially inflammatory uh, food additive and and I also I don't grind my smoothie much I call it a chewy I've got my Nutribullet on for maybe 10 seconds I'm done I'm in I buy into the science that says chewing food and chewing green leafies particular may help promote making nitric oxide uh, from dietary nitrates so I go somewhere between you know really pureed to just eating it out of the bag by just turning it on briefly so I really love the uh, tip about the spices. I really love that. Yeah, organic spices are, you know, if you have relatively fresh, I mean, they haven't been in the, in the pantry for 10 years, uh, particularly organic in today's crazy world, um, you know, you're getting a powerhouse of uh, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant food sources that are not expensive, they're tasty, and you can make every meal instantly better. The worst pizza is better if you got oregano on it. And now, right, just this last week's rosemary has become a hot topic because a community in southern Italy has been found where there's a bunch of people that are reported to be over age 100, and apparently they do everything with rosemary, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, um, you know, a lot, a lot of these kind of local little pockets have their own little lore. But uh, rosemary is the spice of the, of the week for anti-aging. Yeah, you know, I'm always thinking about how can I get more spice in my diet. And adding it to my smoothie, I never thought about that. So thank you. Oh, good. <laughs> well, and, then, and then I love that you say you make it not a smoothie but a chewy. Uh, chewy. Hashtag chewy. That's what uh, <laughs> you should put out there. Uh, are you also a Star Wars fan? Uh, you know, it didn't start that way. I didn't, it wasn't a chewy bucket thing. It was uh, the act of, but I've gotten that enough. And I sure, I certainly do enjoy Star Wars. Uh, awesome. Uh, Dr. Khan, how can our listeners find out more about you? And can you tell them about your books? Sure. They could just look for me in my infrared sauna most of the time. But no, I do have a ask a active practice of preventive cardiology in suburban Detroit. Um, www.drjoelkahn.com and drs, D-R-J-O-E-L-K-A-H-N.com. I'm on Facebook as drjoelkahn.com every day. Uh, try and limit it to a couple of posts a day. Twitter at drjkahn. So uh, very easy to find. I have a book called Whole Heart Solution published by Reader's Digest. It really is a good uh, functional medicine approach to the whole heart uh, going through all the systems of the body, mind, body, and all kinds of approaches. And then I wrote two short little books, one called Dead Execs Don't Get Bonuses, How Not to Die at Work. Kind of goes through the calcium scoring and all these other ways, what questions you ask your doctor, what tests you try and get in your community. It's very inexpensive on Amazon, and one called The No BS Diet, kind of my overview of kind of basic rules of eating, and you can figure out what that translates to for your shopping cart. Okay, so for the listeners out there, in case you are, you have your pedometer strapped on and you're doing laps around the neighborhood, or if you're in your infrared sauna right now, I'll make sure that those links are in the podcast notes so that you can easily find Dr. Khan and all of his great information. Dr. Khan, thank you so much for being my special guest today. This has been an awesome interview. Uh, I love all Canadians, and I love talking to you. My mother's, uh, half my family's proud Canadian, so thank you for letting me beam in all over the world with you, and you have a wonderful day. All right, that wraps up this very special episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show with Dr. Joel Kahn. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in today. And I'd like to invite you back next week for another episode of the Functional Medicine Radio Show. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Carrie Drizga, the Functional Medicine Doc. Have a great week, everyone. You've been listening to the Functional Medicine Radio Show with your host, Dr. Kerry Drizga, known internationally as the Functional Medicine Doc. 
Dr. Carey is committed to helping patients find the root cause of their health problems and fixing the cause with natural treatments so they can feel normal again. Dr. Carey is the founder of Functional Medicine Ontario and is the author of the hit book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Please tell your friends about the Functional Medicine Radio Show. And we'll see you next week with more from Dr. Carey.